within the school for uh, a wider discussion of issues around architectural education uh, as a result of uh, recent events. We're at a time of transition and it seemed that there was uh, uh, that the school was uh, certainly in those kinds of meetings people were becoming very entrenched in conversations about specifics of chairman's contracts and issues of that nature and uh, the attempt of this evening and possibly subsequent evenings is to set a field for uh, a different kind of discussion uh, the idea was that uh, we might be able to establish a series of positions and ideas uh, from within the school about possible futures for the school, about possible new projects and the burial of old ones. Uh, the, the framework for tonight is very open. Uh, I've chosen people who I guessed might have uh, well, people who, who, particularly at this busy time of year, were, were prepared to uh, make statements, and I thank them very much for agreeing to come along tonight. Uh, the field is very open uh, in this, in this uh, first event, and I think uh, if there are subsequent events which follow on, that uh, the discussion might be much more focused. So we'll see what turns up tonight. Uh, and. Uh, see what might follow on from it. Can I thank uh, Mark for stepping in? Uh, David Turnbull is unable to be here tonight, so Mark Cousins has very kindly agreed to chair the evening. Uh, the format will be, I, I've asked uh, the speakers to make short presentations, uh, five to ten minutes, uh, so that we will then have, hopefully, uh, a period of perhaps uh, uh, three quarters of an hour to an hour of discussion following those presentations and we'll try and keep uh, the whole evening down to about an hour and a half. All right. Um, Mark, would you like to...? Okay, well, the format is to be that the speakers will speak for ten minutes. Um, <coughs> I will, it wasn't quite clear what the, what the best... Sorry. Not Sorry. Um, it wasn't quite clear like what would be the best way of positioning the evening, um, but I think it's probably best if each speaker <coughs> speaks for about 10 minutes, and then after they've all spoken, um, that we direct questions at particular speakers. I think it's too disruptive if there are questions to each speaker after they've spoken. Uh, so perhaps there might be like a quarter of an hour uh, after everyone's finished to address specific questions of clarification uh, to particular speakers after they've spoken and then open it really to kind of general, a general discussion. So I'm not quite sure. Peter, do it. Okay, then there is a, a letter. I'm sure there's no need for me to introduce anyone this evening. I'd just like to say thank you to Peter and the Alpha Group for inviting me here, and to Alan Chandler for his collaboration and help. Um, I have to say that uh, I was originally told 10 to 20 minutes, so you're going to have to forgive me this is all, if this is all disjointed, because I'll have to cut it down. Um, my presentation divides roughly into two halves. Um, I'd first like to talk about a conference that I attended in Vienna, and then more generally about the education at the AA. It was very difficult to decide exactly how I was going to organise this, because we weren't set specific topics. Um, I'm sure you'll also realise that what I'm saying is very much from a student's point of view. At the beginning of October 1993, we were invited to accompany Alan Balfour to a symposium entitled Tradition in Transition at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. The students of the architecture department there had asked staff and students of architecture schools from Europe and America to join in a discussion of the function of contemporary architectural education. The Academy of Fine Arts has existed for 301 years with its structure
for the teaching of architecture virtually unchanged. Um, this stems from the prim principles of apprenticeship, <coughs> derives its present orientation from Otto Wagner, who was appointed in Meister in 1894. In Wagner's in inaugural address, he sort of sets out his primary concerns. In the first year, I shall assign my students a simple Viennese apartment house, thereby hoping to give them a sound training in building and a full appreciation of the problems involved. If there is enough time, they can also work on designing a one-family house. In the third year, I shall give assignments that the student may never encounter in their professional life. I wish to leave them free to choose whatever imaginary representation best suits each student's personality. These projects remain a fundamental part of the system. There are currently two Meisterschulen, at the beginning of the course which lasts an average of seven or eight years. The student chooses which school that they want to attend and then does eight projects within that school. The first project is still a survival of, of Wagner's single family house. Work is done on an individual basis and there are no time limits, but students are subject to, as one of the Meisters Gustav Peichel puts it, permanent corrections during the elaboration of projects. In addition, the teaching of specific subjects has been assigned to a parallel structure of five specialized institutes. Urbanism, construction, behavior and space, we never did quite find out what that one meant. The basics of planning and building engineering. Paradoxically, this has led to the separation of theory and practice, which runs counter to the original idea of the Meister as a universalist who teaches all aspects of design and theory to his disciples. Yet, the Meister's absolute authority in determining the progress of the student through the school is preserved. The conference started with pr presentations by the panel, panel of invited tutors, and I'd like to talk about that a little bit later. That was followed by students of the academy giving their views on the Meisterschule system. Positive aspects were cited, ad, cited as the small number of students and the sharing of studio space, a minimum of financial pressure, the school is state funded, the absence of time limits allowing for projects to develop slowly and if office experience to be gained as desired. Freedom of choice in subject matter providing for the opportunity to establish a continuity between projects. On the negative side, the position of the Meister permits prejudices about style and ideology to exist without reference to differing opinions among the teaching staff. Also, they cited the lack of an innovative spirit stemming from the system of staff tenure and therefore the lack of a development of a democratic discourse. In response, members of the panel spoke primarily of alternatives to the Meisterschulen, nearly every aspect of which was seen as negative. Quote, where there is freedom to do whatever, whatever you want, there is no freedom at all. This is a kind of dictatorship, unquote. Quote, stop the idea that your projects go on for years. It's an illusion, unquote. The changes proposed by the panel included open criticism, a plurality of teaching approaches and style, no, no tenure for staff, and a time limit for the projects. In short, the implanting of accepted, and as far as this symposium was concerned, unquestioned formalities of the other schools which were presented, represented. In opposition to this view, and this is obviously the thing that I was most interested in, many of the invited foreign students just suggested that the academy did offer unique opportunities, that the real problem was that too much depended on the student's relationship with one person. If, as was generally agreed in the symposium, there are no more Meisters, there is a problem with the academy's ultimate and complete avoidance of conflict. On the second day of the symposium, the participants were divided into three groups of workshop sessions, which allowed for less formal discussions to take place. This idea worked very well. One group wished to throw out all of the existing structure and start again. The other two groups came to similar conclusions which might be sum summarized as follows. The student might begin the first project through which a Meister would be chosen. A course of action could be decided on with a Meister acting as an advisor to the student throughout the program. Projects would be equally divided between the institutes and the Meister, but the order in which these were carried out would be left open. Institutes would take small groups of students from across the school for a fixed period with assessments in the form of public juries. Work developed with the Meister would, however, continue to have no time limit. <coughs>
This work would then be presented to a review panel of institute professors and visiting critics as well as the Meister. It was felt that only with stability behind an expanded discourse could the most valued aspect of the academy continue, the potential for invest extended investigations. As an aside, I'd like to mention that it was also noted that the oppressively formal academy building itself was preventing interaction from taking place. Moving to a new site might help to consolidate the first stages of transition, a site where open and non-hierarchical spaces could provide the practice of education with new symbolic relationships. I mention this firstly because the academy was thinking of expanding into just such a building, but the architectural school had so far not made a bid for this site. And secondly, also because I believe that the same could be true of the AA. Imagine if the diploma and intermediate school unit spaces faced each other along a corridor, for example. Most of the teaching systems discussed by the panel of tutors at the conference, who were from Harvard, Columbia, Texas, Cooper Union, Athens and Venice, were based on the attainment of knowledge via systematic teaching of the fundamentals of history, theory and design. While studio work plays a prominent role in the education, and many courses are offered as choices between particular topics, the general aim is to provide a broad-based humanistic approach founded on a liberal arts background. The talk, however, was of systems which take the root of creating individual freedom out of a selection of fragmentary learning experiences. The whole, or the semblance of a whole individual, being a product of his or her choices. With the introduction of unit type systems in the other London schools, it is obvious that this autodidactic approach is on the increase here. A point to bear in mind in this context, however, is that ar architectural pluralism paradoxically seems to homogenize so many critical architectural programs. With a liberal arts type education, this is, I suspect, due to large numbers of visiting professors who spend on average perhaps six days a year with each school. The spread of fashion, I think, is a real problem. Autodidactism only offers choice if there is no stylistic bandwagon to jump onto. What is intriguing about the academy is that the stability and supra-individuality afforded by its structure lies strangely outside of these definitions. It is not based on systematic learning and appears dialectically opposed to the notion of individual differentiation, although the projects are being utilized to this end. Seeing the Viennese students' work on the last day made this apparent. The first project, Wagner's Single Family House, was intended to be a practical and programmatic exercise to familiarize the students with vernacular forms and the disciplines of practice. The project has now become a difficult and lengthy cathartic experience, with its resolution representing for the student a form of self-definition. It is obvious from the way that this project is currently interpreted that the rhetoric of change is not necessary in order to achieve a contemporary relevance. In response to the setting out by the Viennese students of what they felt about their educational system, I would like briefly to try to do the same for mine. I have tried to list what I perceive to be the principles that have shaped the environment in which idealistically I have been taught. And obviously this list is in no way extensive or um, properly ordered. One, time to pursue individual work. In America, projects and design studios are nearly always limited to a semester or half year. For example, the lack of extraneous requirements in addition to the unit work and the very good staff student ratio here contributes to this and separates the AA currently from other schools which have introduced the unit system here. The existence of the external student system is necessary in this regard. Two, the need to know basis of working. A self-directed education produces greater intensity of knowledge in opposition to that which is, say, forced fed, which is all too easily forgotten. Three, the potential of coming into contact with other ideas, concepts. The coexistence of many ways of working in a single location. In other words, a provision of a large and varied choice of units and the possibility of learning from attended, attending other units juries. It is a problem that the public presentations of projects by units and the willingness of students to take part in other juries is so marginal. It seems as if in our search for ourself, our identity, we become more and more isolated. We stop being generous to each other. Four, a radical way of accepting students into the AA. 
a panel of tutors from different parts of the school with a student present, reaches a consensus on a candidate's show of spirit and commitment, not necessarily on their exam results or even necessarily on the work that they are showing. We are willing to take risks in accepting students, but it undermines the standards in school if candidates with no promise are admitted. Five, we are, or at least we should be judged by what we do and not what we say. Six, the marketplace. The agreement between tutor and student, student to collaborate. Units are required to justify themselves to students. Students are accepted by a unit in order to participate in the year. This only works if uni units are validated by the chairman, such that there is real strength in the acceptance agreement between the parties. Units must feel fully supported in order that they can be open and public about what they are doing. This support has historically been shown in the non-hierarchical pay structure for tutors. Units that are in any case not open and public about what they do are themselves undermining the strength of the system. The structure of the school, as it is presently set up, requires, I believe, a chairman of exceptional strength, willfulness and sense of direction. Direction which is not academic and conceptual, but as a sense of what the AA should be offering overall in the scheme of things also an ability to manage this direction. This person must be very closely in touch with what is going on in the school in order to make informed judgments about the progress of unit masters and students. In addition to attending jurors unannounced for at least half a day and to attending all reviews, a prerequisite should be to be present at at, at least 20% of all interviews. As a sort of an example, Peter Cook down the road is present at all students' interviews, not that I'm advocating him for chairman. At a time when the turnover of architectural styles and fashionable ideologies is increasing, I think we should not forget to ask the question, what should be made explicit? I am very uneasy a statement such as William MacDonald's in the conference, who in paraphrasing de Certeau, asserted that Columbia invents itself from hour to hour. This, it is explained, occurs by means of an autocritical process which entails a simultaneous critique of the culture of the university and of the education which is provided. I believe that progress comes through the work. Within reason, the more discussion there is about the methodology, the more explicit the process is made, the more articulate we become about it, the harder it is to put pen to paper. The work falls behind in comparison with the words and it is no longer possible to allow the work to find its own route unencumbered. I think it is important to remind ourselves of what it is that the AA stands for, because I feel that tinkering at the edges of this can easily result in an insidious erosion of these values. However, to stand back, reevaluate what it is that the unit system set out to do, why and how that is still relevant or not, is a way of preparing ourselves for the possibility of change and perhaps to permit an evolution to occur. We must be prepared to accept risk. I would like to finish with a quote of Abra Raymond Abrahams at Cooper Union. Education is about resistance. Change comes from desire. don't know how many <laughs> minutes that was. But. Okay, well, as agreed, direct questions to Louisa will come like after everyone has delivered their paper. And the second... <laughs> You're here! I'm still here. Like that. Huh? Like that. <laughs> Holding on. Raoul's not yet here. Or... Not well. I'm, I'm not well, but not yet here. <laughs> I'm in between. God help us. <laughs> God help you. <laughs> um, I'd like to just say a few words about some models that uh, may be useful, maybe not. I don't want to build up speculative models for this particular school, I think it's uh, not possible, at least not at this, uh, at this session. Frankly, I'm not quite sure what this session is aiming at or how it will be 
useful at a later process. So let me drift a little bit, which is to practice what I preach, perhaps, and talk a bit about um, Betwixt and Between, which is an article by Victor Turner, the anthropologist. And he talks about the monsters and the necessity of the monster. And I think it's a very beautiful analogy for what should be done in a, in a school. It's to find or to construct the monsters. Because if you follow his description, description the monsters is something which connects fragments of recognizable things together and uses them, uses certain qualities of these fragments and they're transplanted onto the other. So what you have is a lion's head and a, a man's body and you put them together and somehow in some certain context a quality of the lion's head is being brought onto or is being transferred onto the, the man's body. So we learn that there is a possibility to speculate about a man's body by putting a lion's head on top of it. Now I think that is a, an absolute ground rule for any form of education, that you in a way learn to do that, which is seemingly not there or which you should not do. So although the word monstrous also encapsulates the word monster or demonstration, it goes much further. Victor Turner describes a kind of space, and I won't really get into the details of that, where people are allowed to play freely with factors of reality in order to see how they can be de or recombined, or taken apart and recombined, and in order to, dis to, to discover what can come out, what, what can the accident produce out of this recombination. Now, of course, Victor Turner talks about a situation where there's also a moral to the story, where you discover, well, you cannot do certain kinds of things. If you combine this with that, you bring down the gods on us and we will be destroyed as a whole. Right? So there, there is a possibility, of course, to say, look, you can go so far and not, not further, but a lot of freedom is, is allowed in that stage. Now, this, this monstrous is partly to help you recognize certain conditions in, in, in life that you may want to deal with, that you may want to reconfigure, and may want to touch upon, may want to use. At the same time, it's meant to help you say, well, what if, if it is like this? What if the world is not like we see, but it's actually different? I'm going to tell you how it is different. Now, at that point, there are handheld objects. There, ha there are those things that perhaps tell us how it is the world. At this point, we have a, a kind of a knowledge. You have a situation where we are being taught how to be seeing the world, how it's supposed to be according to tradition or how we should read it. But we can also give those objects back and refashion them and say, look what it can also be like that. If I am able to draw a section of the world within which I live on this piece of wood, I can also redraw that piece of wood and say, well, it's actually quite different. The relationships are not like that. They can be in a different way. I feel they ought to be like that. Now, at that point, I move to another condition, which is that what happens is that in that, that kind of closed off situation is that you use the self as a, as a model. What happens is that you can work on a very intuitive level. In other words, you project something, we often don't know what it is, it's something intuitive, onto this model and thereby onto the environment. Or to go one step further, we project the collective self, if there's such a thing, let's say there's a collective identity, onto this model and thereby onto the environment, which thereby attains a mimetic uh, condition. 
So on the one hand, we have the environment as a mimetic condition. On the other hand, we may then say, yes, but I want to then really manipulate the environment, turn it around and have it influence our identity or the way we operate within the world. So at that point, we have the environment as an indicative condition. So on the one hand, there's the mimetic, and on the other hand, there's the indicative condition. It tells us what to do. And we act as agents in that activity. This is, of course, very crude modeling, but sometimes you have to scratch in wood and believe it has an influence. So, on the one hand, there is a handheld object, which is one-to-one, -one, which is very close to my body. It's somehow it's an extension, I can hold it, I can study it. I can even begin to presuppose that the way the material is formed, or that it is articulated, or that it changes, that that is a form of thought. Because I can project something on it, I can mediate that, what I see, and on that point, it acts as an agent to form my thought. On that point, there is a metaphor which I don't use anymore, but I'm going to quote it anyway. It's, it's, anyway, it's by Clay. It's the thinking hand. Because the moment you use that handheld object in its articulation as a model of a more complex world, you can manipulate it, you can articulate it, you can do something with it. Now, as long as it's handheld, you can do it very intuitively. You can map something on there without thinking almost, and still then project it onto the outside world in the same way. Now, up until here, I talk about a, some kind of external condition. In a way, you are in a closed, protected environment, and you say, well, my model, although coming from this physical world, is outside of it right now. And that's, of course, a, a, a way of seeing the educational space as, a object, as an object external to the world outside us, external to the environment outside us. And I think that is a necessity. And I think that is what Victor Turner is talking about when he talks about this betwixt and between space, which, by the way, he calls a liminal period, a threshold period, something in between. And on the other hand, there is a necessity to place that object as a whole inside the environment, to let the stone or the other handheld objects become part again from its, its former environment and to insinuate oneself into a fabric to trigger unfoldings. This is a condition that belongs to a dynamic field. You could say, well, what if I, as a monster creating agent, belong in effect to a dynamic field, and I am also part of drawing this dynamic field. But all I can do is set a series of conditions which I can draft, graft into this field, which partly belongs to a lot of other people or a very much larger society. And I allow these grafts to influence conditions outside and or to even trigger things and set them in motion. Now, the dynamics of a school is very much like such a model of a dynamic field with many facets of its different parts grafting themselves into a society or into an environment around us and reading the way that these grafts influence that, that field, <coughs> that society. <coughs> now, the dyna dynamics of this field, I'm talking about the school, are about the internal influence and the overall complementariness of various sections of such a school. In other words, the way that <coughs> the different elements within a school play this game, <coughs> but then watch each other playing the game. 
Now, you could say you can't always do that, you can't always play that game. Whereas we're a collective, and of course you can talk about the units, right? the units can play this game, a group can do a workshop a, or a year-long study where it acts as a group, as a model of a dynamic environment, watching itself interact, playing with rules, inserting oneself, being on the one hand external, then again being internal and orchestrating the unfolding of the field itself. But at the same time, I think this model should be protected on the school as a whole. And it should be stated where that can happen, where this dynamic condition can happen, and where you can become a player in this game, whereas where you, you have direct transferal of knowledge, which could say, get you ready for this game, and where you begin to openly play or become a player in such a game. Now, there's a question, and I would like to pose that here, and I think that's something that could be discussed. Whether in a community, there's a need for a community to set itself a series of collective questions, recognizing that it needs such a field and that it needs to define the limits of the field. And to set these questions preceding the judgmental rituals that happen at the end, where, as you all know, we, we set collective faculty sets the standard of, of the diploma. So the question is, is it necessary that a community as a school on a certain point actually says, well, we need some sort of collective field from which, of course, we make sorties. We either retreat within, become figures that are retreating figures, or make sorties out and interact with a, um, an environment of, on a much larger scale try to both map it and interact with it. But is it necessary to set a series of questions that allow comparison and mutual influence to be clear and recognizable and yet to unfold and perhaps chaotically to evolve in a direction that we don't know about? And I'd like to end with this question as a quite open question, is this necessary? How far? How do you do it? Or is it not? Is there somehow a model where absolutely is, there is absolutely no definition of a field with rules, with some collective rules which allow comparison and criteria which can be fought over and yet be de dealt with on a certain point on a, also on a judgmental level. Is it necessary to institutionalize such a field? And is it necessary to, as it were, break a school into different elements which are structured in a very, very different fashion? where the aim and the procedures of the year are either defined in quite clearly separated elements, and I refer back to this, this transfer of knowledge, where you in a way get ready to play the game, and where you say now we are in the field, we set rules, but also we have to show how we play them. And we have to play a game internally which reflects very much the way that these facets also graft themselves on an external environment. Now there's many ways that you could, that you could work with such a model and I don't think we can resolve that here. But I think it will be necessary, and especially I think the recent years in, in the school create an, an absolute need to look at this, uh, at this possibility. I think I'd like to...
to be here. Thank you. Okay, let's move straight on to Fashi. Um, when Peter asked me to participate in this debate on uh, speculative uh, education, uh, I started wondering how I could uh, contribute to this discussion. Uh, I have never had to formulate my thoughts on education at an abstract level, um, and I haven't really had the time to become an expert on the subject uh, between the time of the invitation and today. And uh, therefore, my contributions to this discussion should be understood more as um, a set of propositions uh, uh, of some questions to the audience uh, rather than a well-finished proposal on the issue of uh, education. My questions should be understood, therefore, more uh, from the perspective of an architect who only recently um, became involved in education and uh, who's had the experience of a more or less extended uh, education and the exposure to multiple educational systems. My first thoughts on the title proposed by Peter was the consideration of the word speculative. Uh, why speculative education and not uh, straightforward education? Uh, why, uh, what renders the speculative uh, component of education relevant? Why should we learn to teach to speculate and not simply uh, to produce, to operate, to perform uh, as architects? And then I ask myself to produce what, to operate how, uh, to perform as what. Uh, in the years that I've been involved in architectural practice, I have realized that it is increasingly difficult to uh, define the limits of the uh, architectural practice or the discipline and to find a proper way to operate as, uh, as an architect. Um, it is very different the way an architect uh, operates in New York, uh, Amsterdam, Seville, uh, or London. Uh, the techniques and behaviors that are expected in each of these places are of a very different nature. And uh, within each one of these places, there are enormous differences between the different practices. If something has become uh, much more clear to me after being exposed to different productive and uh, educative modes is that there is no one way of uh, uh, practicing architecture. And even along the course of the career of an architect, the mode of operation may, uh, may need to change. I have had during the last two years exposure to teaching methods in different places on the continent, primarily Belgium and uh, Spain. Uh, architectural education in, in the continent tends to be non-speculative. Uh, it is the result of a traditionally stable, well-regulated, well-defined architectural practice uh, that defines uh, clearly competences for the architect. During my brief experience of these systems, I have detected already a certain discomfort which, with uh, what, has, uh, what seems to have produced a very stale, rigid, sclerotic type of practice that uh, that are already showing signs of fatigue um, once the profession enters the instability that characterizes the, the emerging more forms of development. I have therefore realized that a speculative education, an education that only tries to approximate a discipline by providing tools for a critical practice becomes much more fertile. Uh, the division of production in the discipline in closed compartments, uh, such as the factory, the academy, the bureaucracy, is uh, perhaps part of the 19th century production mode, and uh, therefore in a mode of production where the strict delimitation of boundaries between disciplines and the uncritical description of techniques is rather unproductive, the importance of a theoretical critique of the discipline becomes, in my opinion, a necessary process. Coming from a European school, it was during my American education that I first witnessed this permanent questioning of the boundaries of the discipline rather than their blind reinforcement, and uh, therefore became aware of the importance of a critical, theoretical, speculative education in architecture. It is very evident to me at this point that the traditional discussion between a strict separation of education and research, 
and an education that is detachable from speculation moves clearly towards an education where the domain of operation is not entirely known but, in, but permanently under construction. As every other field of knowledge today, architecture is char characterized more by an ability to explore external areas to the discipline than to provide sovereignties over a determined number of practices or territories. But once we have settled the need for speculative theoretical education and the identity between education and research, once we have affirmed the need for a knowledge that opens new spaces rather than regulates pre predefined domains, we have to come to the second question that I would like to pose here. Um, what are the speculative strategies that we should follow? The critical question here, perhaps where there is likely, um, more likely that uh, there would be a desirability of speculative education, uh, what kind of speculation? Within epistemology, there has been always a traditional discussion between a basic versus an applied research. Should we allow for infinite freedom for absolute detachment of any immediate pragmatic concerns in order to radically shake the foundations of our knowledge as the pioneers of basic research propose? Or should we take into account the types, the conventions of knowledge as indicators of the resistances that reality opposes to our hypothesis and practices as the knights of applied research uh, seem to propose? Should our speculative strategies aim to a very long-term, maybe infinite efficiency, or to a more immediate usefulness. Here is perhaps my more pragmatic attitude as a practitioner, tells me that it is absolutely crucial that our speculative strategies take seriously the problems of resistance and friction with reality. And that is not only a kind of pragmatic, disciplinary comment on speculative strategies, it is also supported on my interest on, in the emerging epistemologies of complexity that, as you know, give an enormous importance to the consideration of the problems of resistance and friction, the traditional uh, that the, scientific, the traditional scientific models ignored as a result of an idealistic conception of knowledge. It seems to me that speculative model uh, that is produced without any negotiation with reality, without resistances and conventions, carries the risk of losing any transformative potential. It is not that I think every evolution of knowledge has to derive directly from a transformation of previous models. It is the certitude that we will not even be able to realize when our speculative procedures are becoming productive without the cons consideration of previous models. We do not have to propose, like Peter Eisenman suggested three weeks ago in this very room, the need to go back to Serlio to understand architecture, Serlio is already more distant to contemporary discipline than musical models, for example, but neither to be like this chef who is commissioned to design a menu and who proposes Monday, minestrone, Tuesday, tomato and mozzarella, Wednesday with a W alphabetically. This uh, would be maybe an inno innovative, atypological, avant-garde speculation, but it is absolutely irrelevant because it does not relate in any way to the history of cooking nor to the existing conventions. Therefore, I would like to state the need for speculative theoretical education as a tool to develop critical and projective positions on the discipline rather than supporting its neutral understanding. But I would state here the need for a negotiating speculation that considers frictions and conventions as the only way to produce tran transformative models of practice. Thank you very much. This was written a couple of years ago, so any, <laughs> any um, speculation you have on current situation is, I disclaim. Um, I would argue that architecture and architectural education has and continues to suffer from a disabling obsession with what I would call easily understood and marketable stylistic icons, which sadly seem to be produced primarily for the entertainment of what has become, again, sadly, an increasingly leisured architectural elite. 
Architecture, for as long as I can remember it, has never been judged by its capacity to engage in and manipulate cultural and political <coughs> realities, but by its currency as part of individual lifestyle and commerce. Most British schools, and I think the AA can be included in this, have been complicit in this process of devaluation for very good financial reasons and very pragmatic reasons, but nonetheless they have. They have accepted the mediated version of architecture as their reality and have used this as the basis of their academic agenda. Within this climate, and I think it's something which we must talk about, it is generally accepted that a clear architectural product backed by a well-clapped individual is the model for success, a model of resisting financial assault, um, attracting students, and so on. I would take issue with this. I think that in many ways this model is um, redundant and now woefully inappropriate. That's very negative. Um, I would say what element does one have for optimism in that situation? And I would go back to my experience as a teacher. I would argue that over the last few years there has been a fundamental a realignment in the values, not of teachers, but of students. The cult of the personality, whilst it seems to be devalued elsewhere, is still fairly current in the architectural circles. I think students have begun to take the lead um, in rejecting existing models based upon success and personal promotion, wealth and publicity and all of that that follows, and they are taking the lead in demanding that schools work to reinvent the discipline of architecture as a relevant and accountable social art. Um, capable, if not of shaping, but certainly participating in pressing national and international geopolitical change. The recent concentration on the marketable artifact, I think, has generated a, a, a very self-serving and introspective architectural culture, which perceives elitism as the only weapon it has to resist a devaluation of its status and academic credibility. Unfortunately, the situation gets worse. Into that vacuum have stepped a host of competitors, very effective competitors, who have taken over the traditional role of the architect, so diminishing the role for architectural services, and thus, I'm afraid, the need to contain the current status quo of architectural education. Architectural education has, in many instances, simply been reduced to a form of very, very sophisticated youth opportunity program for the middle classes, a form of continued entertainment. I would argue that the role of the architect is in an absolute state of crisis, and that we, any of us, can no longer afford to bury our heads in the magazines and ignore this. It has to be addressed, and I think this should be a part of that. Within the context of these changes, um, schools of architecture, I think, have an obligation to speculate and to reinvent um, the discipline of architecture as a relevant and accountable social art. I have absolutely or very little idea of how one might do that. Um, all I can refer to is my own experience as a teacher. And I would just like to, without repeating myself, really just refer to certain of the strategies that Carlos and I use in our unit. They're all based upon the level of the individual. But I would argue that they, they might, in a way, have some clues at the level of the institution. So what then might be the nature and structure of an educational system capable of attacking the primacy of the, art, of the architectural artifact and restoring the architect's ability to engage successfully with contemporary culture? As a teacher, um, I've employed specific methods of doing this. As you probably know, they center on concepts of direct action and direct involvement, placing the student as an individual in a directly experienced relationship with the world out there. Um, whatever else that has, whatever effect that has on the speculation about urbanism is irrelevant in this conversation. What it does have is a very liberating effect in connecting the individual with their own ethical and moral position, 
so they operate from that position, not from some mediated or spectacularized version of that position. It also, I think, has the ability to dictate a pathway whereby students can find a more effective role beyond their studentship, which I think must be a crucial part of our agenda. I'll chop out a section here. I would argue then that such methods do have a clear counterpart at the scale of the institution as a whole. And I think the crucial act of that, or the crucial centre to that, is that the willingness of individuals and staff to become directly involved is matched by the institution as a whole. I think any institution must now embark upon the extremely difficult task not of defining differences, not defining differences in order to make any individual or any institution more unique, but defining a collective position, the much harder task of defining collective certainties rather than individual differences. And that that collective position must be used to communicate effectively and participate effectively in um, national and international situations. Um, I would argue that there is proof that if that works for the individual, it would bring a breath of fresh air into an institution generally. This bit's a bit more particular. Within the context of a search for collective responsibility and engagement, I would say that it is certain that no institution can any longer afford the luxury of a structure which is primarily based upon competition and internal dispute. Whilst this undoubtedly produces the illusion of vitality, I think it dissipates and saps the very energy, the energy of um, attack and embattlement and resistance which would be really necessary to address a much wider audience. A very, very difficult balance would need to be maintained in such a structure. Um, any, structure any institution is required to contain within its boundaries in order to engage effectively in the outside world a model of the status quo whilst constantly um, maintaining and nurturing the mechanism whereby that status quo is constantly undermined and attacked. It might, it seems, a very, very difficult balance. Therefore, from the level of the individual student to the level of the institution as a whole, I feel the aim, the pressing aim, must be to ground the architectural experimentation in a directly experienced and genuinely felt international cultural context. This honest grounding, I think, is, has never been more um, necessary. Faced with the erosion of the architect's traditional role, the fragmentation of architectural debate, schools have no choice, I think, but to take the lead in the defense of architecture as a relevant and unique social art, and should accept extremely radical means are now required to do so. Okay. I, I have a proposal. I, what, Peter, what time do you want to stop? Quarter to nine. Quarter to nine. Uh, so that we have 40 minutes. Um, I would suggest that we spend about 20 minutes of that. Uh, directly kind of interrogating and commenting on what we've heard and then open it up for general discussion. But I also think perhaps I would like to make a suggestion here uh, which is that perhaps there may be a useful order of interrogating the speakers which wasn't the order in which they spoke in. Uh, if it's <laughs> acceptable, what I'd like to propose is that it does seem to be... Well, well, except <laughs> that... that, that Roberts, I mean, we could either do it exactly by kind of rote, but actually kind of Roberts' contribution, it seemed touched on like the widest issues of an engagement kind of outside. 
uh, I would say, I mean, if we, if we took the Marxist principle of moving from the abstract to the concrete, um, you know, Raoul's touched on questions of, like, the formation of judgment. Fashid's touched on, you know, the question of the, the conditions and constraints of architectural work within architectural education. Um, and Louise has, I think, kind of dealt very sort of crisply with certain kind of very specific issues. And, and I think that, you know, following that line, which then can be reversed in the general discussion as it's opened up, I'd propose that. So does anyone who, who would like to ask or comment on Robert's contribution? You said uh, when you were condemning a form of elitism, you said that architecture, or at least architectural education, had to return to a sense of accountability. But what you didn't say is accountable to whom? Accountable to a wider public. And that is traditionally addressing, or recently <coughs> addressing. But if you say that architecture is being co-opted and turned into a sort of broad-based discipline that anybody can perform in, it seems like that's incredibly generally accountable. In other words, anybody can do it. You can't get more general than that. I think anybody can do a version of it. That's not the same as it being um, applicable and appropriate and relevant. Which is judged by... <coughs> its application, I think, within a very wide context of its application. I mean, it just seems to me that there's this kind of paradox that says, we don't want to be elite, we want to get back to dealing with the direct real world, but we know what it means to do it right, and we haven't been doing it yet. And this question of who knows it hasn't been being done right suggests that there's somebody making this adjudication, which is not the general public. Otherwise, what's being done is acceptable because that's what's general. I, th I wouldn't dismiss that that the the adjudication of the general. I don't think the adjudication of the general public in that way should be dismissed. I think it should be examined and taken very seriously. So if, if two million people go to, to Richmond <laughs> and only 55 go to Vitra, then we know where we should go. I think we should um, not dismiss that instantly. which we have tended to do. Is, is that a version of the same? Uh, it's, it's not really a question. I, mean, uh, I, I would say uh, there are two ways of being elitist. One, one is to be elitist within one's own profession. The other one is being elitist within the whole intellectual field. Uh, dealing with other professions, other discourses in society. And what you propose could, could be uh, either of those. It, it could be dealing with the general public, but it could also be dealing with other people, sociologists, economists, uh, people who, you would say, from the towns, the regions, etc., which hasn't really been. Uh, attempted, uh, this sort of address hasn't been attempted by what you criticised. So I, I would say it's not necessarily a question of uh, people voting, which building is the best, or things like that. 
relationship to culture, but the implication of the word any was that all institutions, you said any, but actually the implication was that all institutions must be considered. And I'm wondering, what is the sense, particularly if one takes a, a takes it in regard to some place like the AA, this sense that all institutions have a similar and same fulfilling role, as opposed to not the exception in terms of everybody trying to be different, but that because there is general institutionalization, do all institutions have to become that institutional role? I, I, I can't answer that. I mean, I'm stating perhaps for extreme reasons a particular position to provoke that response. Yes, within the context of this, I would argue that that must be one of the forms of judgment that one would use to, to look at the structure of the comparative, to use as a mechanism for looking at and comparing different architectural educational structures. So in that sense, yes, I think it should be something that you should use together with another, a whole armory of other criteria to look at any model. Whether it becomes dominant or not, I think, is, is another issue. But isn't that, I mean, that question of this sense that, that to, to propose and promote a role is to already take into accountability its dominance thereafter, as opposed to taking it as always maintaining the condition as the exception, and allowing the dominance to still exist, and not replacement by a new role. I think that, that the, the, the model of accountability, or the requirement for accountability, must be contained within any model of education, must be present within any model. Could I it can take very different forms, but it might be present. Could I sort of try and draw out like a practical implication mm. of that? Because it seems to me you could argue about accountability mm. and one way traditionally that sort of a category of so-called progressive intellectuals have justified themselves as being anti-elitist but accountable is in some sense to put it down to the future or you know whatever kind of political projects in hand. But since, in a sense, that, that we were considering the, the, the specific question of education, one thing that kind of struck me as, a, as an immediate and practical element of what you were saying uh, was the, the kind of the ethical necessity of pushing a student mm. immediately and on an individual basis into a form of social activism and investigation. Um, you know, a, a, as a condition mm. for the formation of this type of project. Now, it seems to me, you know, that it's there that one starts kind of meeting the, the like the specific mm. kind of proposal. Mm. Is, is there something more you'd like to add about that? I think, I mean, obviously one's talking from a very particular position and it's related to what we do here. But I think it is, it is a necessary and effective anic um, antidote to immersion within a very within other forms of endeavour, it's not by no means it is by no means comprehensive. It is a form of rebalancing, a form of laxative, which I think is very very important within what can otherwise become a very atrophied and self-serving culture. That that element is introduced, not exclusively, that it is introduced, formulated, and um, imposed to a certain degree. Does anyone want to take that? Sorry, Kim. Well, it's not so much a question um, as it is a, as a pondering. Um, as, as a student, I'm actually quite uh, happy to hear what you, have, what, you, what you said in a very um, digestible form. In the, uh, I'm only in the second year, but when I'm in an architectural institution that presents what I feel has become increasingly over-focused on issues that are beyond architecture, such as, like, I knew complexity is a very sort of trendy issue at the moment, and we had a wide symposium on this issue of complexity in architecture. But the accessibility of those ideas to students in the lower school are almost, you know, you know, you know unable to make that leap. 
And I do think that there is a place for these ideas about architecture being a social art, um, which even the most basic understanding can be grasped, and I think that it needs to be taken into account in any model that, that we propose. Can I see it from a very different perspective? As a practitioner, that one suffers constantly from what seems to have, I mean, when seen from a distance, manifests itself as a sort of um, collective negligence by the architectural profession, by architects, architectural education over the last 10 years, in that it seems to have been negligent in ignoring or turning its back on um, a whole set of very humble and um, deep felt issues, certainly in this country. It has actually not only just ignored them or, or, or failed to recognize them, but has, has set itself in many cases in a, in a completely opposite path. And that has led to, an, I think, an almost irretrievable situation, certainly in Britain, where the number of people and the way in which the 90%, 99% of the buildings in this country are realized excludes architects in quite an aggressive way. It's not accidental anymore. It's, it's aggressive and pointed, and it is, a, it is a genuine decision by the public at large. And I don't know what one does about that. It seems to be a situation which we have to question, and we have to really question ourselves as to whether we wish that to be, to continue to be the case. Because it, I think it is painful to see that. Martha. You refer to the traditional, what you call the traditional role of the I'm not advocating a return to the traditional role of the architect well, at all. Could you just expand upon your kind of the idea yeah. of the role? I think the traditional role of the architect is the architect as um, the primary um, agent um, of an individual client or, a, or an institution in the realization of their, um, their aims and ambitions in the form of a building. So it is really the primacy of the architect as as the principal um, agent within the, the construction process, which has inevitably given the architect a certain uh, uh, status, which they have enjoyed and cease to enjoy. What, what year is that based on? Sorry? What year? In what year? Well, I mean, that traditional, I'm just interested historically <coughs> where that description might come from. I mean, that is, that is, the, that is the, contractual and um, operational description that is promoted and tr attempted to be maintained by the RIBA. Right, I know, but I'm, what I'm interested in is a sort of specific naming of when that really existed, so that I can locate it, because of my... <laughs> no, it never existed. Well, that, I mean, that's part of the problem, isn't it? I mean, it's a sort of myth itself which suggests that that's what we need to return to. Or at least that's not what they're saying. It used as a point of reference, which is, as a cliche, almost irrelevant. But I was not saying that that was something to be returned to. No, I understand it's a point of reference. It is a point of reference. I think but it's, it's not real. I think you can argue that it, it never existed, but I think it did. Okay, good year. <coughs> I think it existed. It existed in my father's generation of architects very clearly existed on the ground. It existed in the, in the social projects that followed immediately after the war years. When it died, it's harder to, to define. It also depends on how you define the role of architect. I mean, if that includes the master builder, then it existed for a lot longer than... Maybe, sorry, I'm, I'm looking at the watch, and maybe we should kind of move on to just one, one. Robert, because I saw it in all of what you said, but um, is it correct that you, you want to make the educational structure accountable to um, people in general? And if, if that's the case, is that something which can be structured, or is it something which has to occur automatically by forces larger than architecture itself? I think the only thing that I, one can be certain about is that 
Um, there must be an obligation to be accountable to oneself as an individual first, and that the education must demand that. I think that is the pre prerequisite to finding any connection with a role which is accountable to a wider public than that, which might include the general public or not. But all one can say with certainty is that it is crucial to start at the level of the individual and not to allow um, fictions to intervene in, in that process. No, commonly agreed fictions. No, I understand. But what I was getting at was the, the point of view is still that attitude, which I obviously concur with, um, to the point where like, that becomes automatic because of what's going on. I mean, back in the 1960s, it might have been a different scenario, but they decided more easy to think about that. Whereas in this society, it's a complete reaction. And you're, you know, you're very unfashionable to think in those terms. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely right. So what I'm trying to get is at what point can you even stir at what point can you just um, have to the forces? You can instill a recognition of its absence. You can instill a recognition of the compromise. You can't instill the, the ability to do it. You can, you can instill guilt, <laughs> if you like. Let's move on to questions to Raoul, although it does seem like there's an emergent thing which, you know, if people are c can draw the most benefit uh, out of the educational proposals that are buried in what people have said, you know, we, we need to sort of forge a slightly different kind of practice of asking questions. Mm. Uh, which is that people have made statements and, and it, it seems reasonable to kind of suggest that the question should be aimed at like what the pedagogic or institutional implications of what they say is. Who would like to interrogate Raoul? <laughs> <laughs> You've got to ask him some questions and don't <laughs> I asked the question. <laughs> so. Where? Somebody? Um, uh, I would love to uh, address the dynamic field that you mentioned and uh, to ask whether we need a game uh, with rules, whether we need to institutionalize this dynamic field. Uh, now, would you agree that if you have different participants in this field who are not, in effect, part of the team, they haven't been elected uh, as, say, a rugby team or a football team is chosen for different roles, those participants would inevitably want to participate in such a thing as a general game in different ways and perhaps to varying degrees. And we have actually seen that at the LA. We have seen that over the years certain units keep influencers and uh, you only see the end of the year exhibition and that's an external sign. And other units uh, run different programs, address the whole school, etc. Now, how one would possibly institutionalize uh, such a field where the participation is already fixed, already defined? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Balls of power, I guess, between the, somebody organizing a model. In other words, you can't actually have an author of a model. And then you get a process of negotiation, where you have players that come into that model, let's say it's a game structure. And because they are players, of course, they have a certain amount of, of say, let's say, let's say weight. So at that point you get, I think, a fantastic process of negotiation where you, you will have to persuade perhaps players to play along the rules of the model to some degree. But you also have counter arguments, resistance, right? We heard the word resistance several times today. You will get resistance from the player against the model, so you have the argument for the model. 
and so on. I think that's part of the, the process itself. But, uh, I think you're you're right in saying. I mean, you may say that that. Play. I mean, this this goes to the question of how you set up a hierarchy. Do you allow an author of a, of a model in, or do you give such a role to a chairperson or committee or whatever? Right. Do you actually have a model which in itself is variable, which has to be set and not simply enshrined forever and ever? I think you can have the possibility that you you can have alternative models which are uh, acted out in, in, in detail. So you know, you know, the school being one model, and then within that you have other possibilities, smaller models. They may become very effective. They may become so effective that that team or even other people say, look, uh, that model is actually, <laughs> we need to change the, the bigger model. And I think that's certainly the situation that's happening. Do you think there's a minimum requirement to be set in terms of participation? Yeah, I think that needs to be done and it is done. But we have been doing that until now. But I think the, there's a possibility that the, the model that is <coughs> set up, that's what we we'll talk about the diploma schools, a series of units, they act within a model called unit system. I think it's possible that that model becomes so atrophied that uh, <laughs> basically there's a, like a plasterboard with little voids inside and every kind of pops up their head. That's what we're doing at the end of, of the year. I think that's uh, very dangerous because then it's not a model <coughs> anymore. I mean, Robert said something about the model being embedded in the operations of the school, but it remains a model. It remains something that's set there, looked at, you can see all the elements, and that is, needs to be able to, uh, to also move with internal forces. But that means that those internal forces must be willing to, to, to push against the uh, other the edges of their, of their space. That's that interaction that I talked about. I think you can, of course, talk on and on about you know people not coming to juries anymore, which have students and things like that. But that's in a way a symptom of it. What I'm proposing is something where you have a, a certain amount of not consensus, but attempts to to set collective criteria. I mean, if I could just like make a well, is there an immediate question? I mean, if I could just make a comment. I mean, like when Robert talks about like the conditions of accountability, which are kind of external, which you know in that sense seem to me the most abstract. They're obviously very important. Raoul raises the question of like the internality of accountability. And I think it's very important when people discuss it in an institution. We're not the first people to discuss this. He's really kind of worrying away at exactly the question that Kant worried about in the third critique, uh, which is how is it that something can be as a, like a, in this case, an architectural judgment, it is vital that it, it is a subjective judgment, and yet which is only a judgment by virtue of appealing to other people. Um, and, and I think it's important that, like in a way, you know, the, the questions are, are sort of to some extent formalized in a certain historical dimension, because that undoubtedly, it, I mean, you know, Raoul is asking the kind of Kantian uh, question. No one's ever produced an answer. Uh, but the question's never gone away. Um, so I was going to ask a question before you got off. Sorry. <laughs> That's literally, I can't cope with that part. I just wanted to ask uh, Raul, probably it passed to Robert too, um, is it possible, do you think, to pursue the model you're suggesting um, within 
uh, and I sound like a devil's advocate here, but I'll just ask the question. Within the um, system of an RIBA recognized school, which at the present time we have um, managed to um, contain certain models, um, I think it would be fair to say within a certain context, but if we were to push this, um, as far as you're perhaps suggesting, I think that we might be saying that we wish to reject um, that particular thing. Is this a question to both of us? It feels like equally to both. <coughs> yeah, it applies yeah. perhaps more to roles. What, what was the end? <laughs> the, the, the rejection bit, I didn't quite understand that. What, can you repeat the last bit? What? About the rejection. Well, I, I'm asking you if you think in order to achieve what you're suggesting, um, we would have to come out of the RMBA kind of, well, the kind of whole idea of complying. Either why do you do that to those parameters? I'm not sure. I think that it is uh, it's good to, to test certain. Uh, uh, Desires, as it were, body desires against the limits that are that are enshrined, let's say, on the national level, on the international level, too. I think if you, as a school, if you are, if you are, if you're keen to demonstrate <coughs> that you can deal with topics or architectural conditions that are necessary to deal with, let's let's look at. You know, the breakup of the Soviet Union now. What is the school, the school of Architecture doing in, in Moscow? What is what is the basis for their new criteria? How now are going to set? Are going to they are they going to set their their new uh, curricula for their uh, well, still the, the same school, but I would say for their uh, the new schools that are bound to be there. How are they going to? Um, Try to find out what what an identity is and how that can be expressed. In other words, how do you decide on form in 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 an architectural process? How do you have any consensus on that? I mean, <coughs> now I think we we should play a role in that search. We can't s step outside from that, and to do that, you actually have to be seen to be um, constantly fighting with the resistance of uh, the, the kind of uh, acknowledged, you could say, the acknowledged, uh, I would actually use the word mask of the, of the profession. It's a, it's a game, but it's a very serious game. Right? It's an exchange, a game that has to do with, with constantly testing, testing each other. I think you can remove yourself too much at a certain point. And I think in the, in the experiences I've had in this, 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 this our unit, dealing with uh, RRBA people, I don't see any problem there. Mm. If you argue your case, if you argue why it's necessary to go this far, to, t to take this risk, I think the people that we've been able to have so far have wholeheartedly agree with the necessity of that to exist. And also to exist in the name of an established uh, profession. But in a sense, um, I still think that you're talking about um, uh, what you've been doing within a context of the whole school, which um, has represented very many different approaches, plus the fact that we actually invite those external examples, yeah, yeah, of course, right? of course, exactly. which is very particular. Um, that is somewhat different from something set up by the RIBA, which at the moment they are actually in the process of trying to do, which is very much more pragmatic than anything we've had so far. You know, I mean, it, it might require us stepping outside that, which has obviously very few um, results for the school, in a sense. It's just a yeah, I think that would be, uh, that would be a, a big game to play, I think. I think at that point, the whole uh, situation would switch from a purely national uh, game of ping pong, we versus the RIBA, to us saying, look, RIBA is simply not relevant anymore.
right? We must be able to act on a supranational level, and there must be some sort of understanding or criteria that will be developed by us and others on a supranational level. So that will need then another kind of network, other contacts, other players in that in that situation also. It's something that's that's what also is referring to already. I don't know what to, what to comment. I think the Arabi would be delighted if, <laughs> if it became more focused. Should we move on to people who have questions for Fashid? You know, is is a question to Fashid in in the form that that kind of she spoke about, like on the one hand, the question of architectural kind of speculation, and then you know her characterization in a sense of reality, whatever form it takes, but as a resistance. Uh, so. Well, basically, I think I, I, I agree with you. That uh, it is on the one hand, it, 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 you choose your model uh, <coughs> to research. Uh, however, there is at a certain point when um, you negotiate. I mean, at least this was. Uh, isn't this what you're saying? Yeah, but uh, what I'm saying as well is that sometimes a specific kind of work cannot accommodate both. It cannot do both things. There is work that. I believe in coming in that does work for its own sake, for the world's sake. See how far I can go, maybe we don't know where. But the, the journey is what is important. Well, that's, I guess, I mean, I Sometimes to, like, talk about down. basic research and applied research. And in a way, what you are saying is that there is basically these two, that you, you may do a certain research that, uh, you know, perhaps it's, it's uh, you don't consider that it's, uh, Applied research is basically where you, you um, perhaps consider reality or the resistance. And, and it is important how it, it actually gets, uh, uh, gets applied. Uh, and it's basically a second one, and, and not when it is only for its own. Uh, when basically what, in the first model that you're suggesting, <coughs> There is no time limit, perhaps. There is perhaps no no specific uh, immediate use. And what you were saying is that there is a need for both. Yes. Well, that's fine. And most of the time, that's where the that's where you get the the, the one feeds from the other. The the abstract of the paper inside starts from the the building takes off, and if it's like it, we come back again. But it's necessary. But perhaps what you're also saying is that um, currently the way the system is set up, 
both of those things can take place. And um, the weakness with the current system is that other than an individual student going through, through both of those types of experience, um, there is no other way of one thing feeding the other um, as the institution um, is you know, presently lacking a debate across those areas. I mean, what's great about it is those things happen. What's not so good about it is that other than the individual's experience of traveling through those, those things, there is no way of um, actually articulating um, the ground between them and then um, moving on from there. It's up to the student, yeah. Sometimes you need to have a unit that's completely pragmatic, right? and a unit that's completely... You know, so what I'm saying is, and then this is one of the things that, is, that does exist currently about the school. And it's one of the things that, in a sense, um, you know, we need to think about in terms of what Robert was saying. I mean, I you know, have great sympathy with that. Um, but it is a problem because the way that the system is currently set up, we have the opportunity to do that in one part of the school, in one unit or whatever. What the school doesn't do is take itself as, as a direction and say, okay, um, the, the way forward now is to be socially aware. We've got to go out and sort of try and struggle to increase the architect's role again. We're falling into disrepute. We're all becoming prima donnas, um, which might be fun, but it's not terribly useful. Um, but, you know, in a sense, um, that is exactly what the current system is not set up to do. Because there is no way of voicing a particular strategy, of voicing a particular direction. There is this amorphous um, route through the school which allows you to participate in any of those particular interests and then come out the other end. Peter. Uh, I was just uh, thinking that instead of the dynamic view of being a unit, the dynamic field was much like, you know, like a giraffe in which there were you know, many dynamic fields. Um, that the unit that is just, there is no hierarchy. The unit is just one of those giraffes, you know, giraffes, pieces of giraffes. And, and that it's no different uh, from, let's say, an exhibition, <coughs> a lecture, or the rest of it. And that would then provide uh, that that it should provide the connection between these, uh, these uh, patches. I don't think the patches necessarily need, need to mean um, uh, the back-to-back -back of units, the joint of units, or the joint juries of units, or whatever it is, but it can be much, it can be, I think it can be much more um, which might be do the exhibitions or publications or special events or in which in which the unit work can be bounced off so that the unit work maintains a focus. And I would say that the school was a platform which was much wider and so the school was always trying to be wider and the units were always trying to focus on the unit and the, um, the units and the exhibitions policies uh, all of the other things that go on in the school and perhaps things that don't go on in the school that should go on in the school would be the place where people join together. But uh, <coughs> I, what, I, I mean, what I don't understand in, in, in that is what is what is the fault of the structure that doesn't already allow that to happen or that has ever previously made it happen? I mean, what what is there institutionally that doesn't allow that to happen now? Or if one says that it used to happen, how was the structure different that forced it to happen? Because if we're talking about this place and, and the sort of institutional structuring of it that creates types of education or, or, or prevents types of education, what, what, is, what is the mechanism that now exists that won't allow all those things that you advocate to happen? other than just laziness or disinterest or something like that. If you accept that it works like an orchestra, then you need a conductor. Sorry? If you accept 
Yeah, or you could have the idea that as grown up mature individuals we could have some destiny in our own hands as opposed to waiting for somebody else. You know, or try speaking to the Berlin that's, Philharmonic. That's maybe try to do. <laughs> Why? Yeah. Sometimes it's yeah, but I mean, if, if we are at fault because we spend all our time trying to decide, how can we blame anybody else for spending their time trying to decide? I mean, I don't understand why the school doesn't suffer the same demand of responsibility that it wants to give on anybody else. You need something to respond to. Why? Why do you need something? Why can't you just do it yourself? It requires a certain degree of belief, and I think that is... Uh, so what you're saying is that there's, nobody believes themselves? I'm saying there is... There is. I mean, I put it there more strongly in answer to your criticism of what <coughs> Peter said, than that it is a system of <coughs> priorities, and the priorities at the moment rest in such a way that energy, the, the energy is dissipated within certain activities, which on a very practical level preclude the sort of uh, speculation you're talking about, actually yes. preclude that bringing together, because we are frankly too busy defining differences. So what, what is the institutional structure that will counter those practicalities? I think it's sort of like being a little bit pregnant. I don't believe with what Peter's saying. I don't believe you can actually maintain patches within a structure which is attempting to um, and formulate some form of collective mm -hmm. position. I think they're totally incompatible. Well, and I think as long as you maintain the two in the same organization, what you're saying is true. It will appear to be a lack of, it will appear to be inertia. It feels like, um, on the one hand, meetings like ready to engage in general issues, but could people kind of form questions to Louisa's, although she spoke first, she did actually make extremely concrete suggestions, uh, some of which may have flown from people's minds. Could I ask you then, I mean, you, you know, you had quite specific recommendations at the end of what you said, all of which seemed to me entirely constructive, but did you actually kind of felt that in some interesting or important way they flowed from the Vienna model, most of which I've only heard about, like with horror before? I mean, it, it seemed to me you, you gave it a kind of jolly generous gloss. Yes, I suppose that's true. Um, I think that there are things to be learned from the Vienna model in that um, one of the problems with um, what I described as a sort of self-directing and fragmentary education um, where the individual is, um, picks up whatever it is that they pick up as they go through um, is the fact that there isn't this possibility of um, a continuity, uh, someone who would potentially act as an advisor in your route through, um, which in a sense comes back to Robert's um, idea in a way of social accountability. Um, and therefore, although I'm not in any way advocating the Vienna model as the model that we should um, look at, I do think there are aspects of it um, which are genuinely interesting and useful for us to perhaps assimilate. Um, and I think of that, and I mean, I don't know terribly much about what goes on at Cooper Union, but from what I've heard, there are certain aspects of what goes on at Cooper Union um, which also have a slightly sort of overseeing role. Now, I don't want to have that to the detriment of not being able to make our own choices and to be free about doing those. But I think there could be more of a negotiation 
um, between tutors and students such that no that negotiation doesn't start at the end of one year and finish at the end of one year. Um, that there is potential for more of a um, route to be continued through. Right. Yeah, I mean, I'm partly coming back to you, but partly to Peter, I, I think it's actually necessary to define social responsibility also in terms of making claims as an institution, making claims to <coughs> have a job in restating the profession. I'm, I'm, I'm sensing a little bit from him that's, well, you know, as long as you give him that variety, it's okay, but that's not good enough, I think. And also, you know, the, the, the spectacle of simply having a series of different units doing their their thing, I think is the death of an institution. I think you will lose direction. I think people will lose respect in you, and I think you lose independence. That you will effectively become a morph. I think you have to, with risk of being wrong, try to define and stake out the territory. Say, look to the professions. You negotiate with the profession. Look, you're right. <laughs> you're not thinking about this. You ought to be thinking about this. We are. So let's show you some, some things. That's partly negotiation, partly also insertion. It's kind of making a claim. I mean, I, I agree with you, there's a self-responsibility, but that, is, that goes even onto the level of having ambitions, actually, having ambitions that you have something to tell, and also the necessity that, that you format it. And I would say format it not only on the level of, of, of single beings or, or units going, out and negotiate with whatever environments, but also as, a, as, as an institution itself, that are ambitious that you can uh, offer alternatives. And I think that's a, it's a different form of accountability, which is not so easy to, to quantify, of course. This, it, it depends a hell of a lot on a, on a certain kind of belief. And to then cast the, the results of the, of the struggle is, I believe, to cast that in a, in, a, in, a, in a format which is negotiable, which, of course, which can mediate. Now, when it, it is a very difficult question how you then, uh, whether the, the current structure can deal with it or whether kind of five out of ten should get together and get a very strong image or whether there should be one conductor. That's a whole next discussion, you know, a very technical discussion also. In a way, you have to kind of decide for one way or the other. But all one can be certain of is a necessary prerequisite to that discussion. And then people have touched on it at various points. You've touched on the concept of a real risk, accepting genuine risk as an institution. Mm. I think it surely must be, must be true that um, the institution should risk complete dissolution and failure rather than merely um, continue for the sake of continuing. And I don't believe that there can, there can be any form of, of reassessment or any of those structures can, structures of um, collaboration can, can emerge until that risk, that threshold has been stepped over. And I think as an institution we are miles away from accepting that position. We want to move from one lover <coughs> to another lover without any risk. But, I mean... I think we should kind of like to throw it open. But, I mean, that issue of risk. I mean, there are obviously several ways of analysing an institution. You can do it sort of structurally. You can do it as some remarks have been addressed to, which is like how things ought to be taught. And then, you know, like Peter has raised the question, like not so much how it should be taught, but actually to analyse the place through what is actually learned. Um, you, you can kind of analyse it in, in different ways. Um, the, in all of them, the question of risk seems to me kind of central, especially when one knows that, you know, if there is one boring law about institutions, it is that their logic commits them in some way to survival and reproduction. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and therefore, you know, how, how does one insert that element of risk? into the constitution of an institution which almost without anyone noticing is designed for something else. There, there were several questions. Robert. Well, I was only going to make the same point you just made. I would suggest that you do that by inserting a, an element of self-destruction, if you will, in the institution 
which then might connect to this observation that units tend to be introspective and by their very nature uh, close in and become more individual and yet there's a need there's this this force of, in, of, of internal accountability which is a kind of desire but has no mechanism if you will the concept that there's an external accountability may in fact be something that one contemplates about the chair or the table or whatever sits in that office up there. Perhaps there's an element of, of a role, uh, I think we're, what I'm hearing is a, is a need for a role which actually forces in some way this internal accountability that creates a structure which is meant to be conflictual uh, in a way that <coughs> actually creates more tension than we know now. Nonetheless, it is, it is the kind of tension that allows life to continue rather than the stultification that people have to talk about. It creates more conflict rather than tension. Yes. I like this bit about the building in the method for self-destruction. <laughs> mean it so that there isn't kind of a natural swing towards the other side to save that, which allows the self this self-destruction. Which would be the and then which should be the nature of the institution for self-preservation. Yeah. Would would be the force that that you want somehow you want to conceive a way to counteract that, and the two would then be a form of life. I think I just would reply to something you said about I think what you say about risk and um, belief is absolutely right. But do you think that uh, the way that the school is structured financially, mm -hmm. that it's possible for that to occur? Mm -hmm. now, what I'm saying is that um, over the last 15 years or so, the access to the school has become smaller and smaller. <coughs> and therefore, the type of people who come from school aren't necessarily um, as it were, the whole range of people who could come in and have that pollution risk. So what I'm saying is I think we're kind of stuck with the fact that um, the level of our students is gradually going down, therefore the fact that the tutors as being greater personalities, which is what we respond to. And there's a, there's a, I think there's a huge infrastructural problem. So if you suddenly change that and then say 50% of the students who came here could come here without having financial hassle and having to pay off debts for the rest of their life, then I think you half solve all the problems we're talking about in an instant because you'd have a quality of student coming through. You wouldn't have to ask yourself the question, what do I do? They just go and do it. And there wouldn't be a question of like, well, do you believe in risk or something? Of course I don't believe in risk, I'm going to do something. And then you as a tutor would become, your personality would become less obvious and the students themselves would start to drive it. I mean, from my point, from what I can see, from my experience is that, uh, say for example, the period of the mid-70s, when the school seemed to be at its strongest in some degree, there was enough um, grant aided students to be able to come to the school. And they would do something like set up their own things. They'd set up any kind of thing and just do it. Okay, that spirit has to a certain degree been left off, but we're, we're still in a situation where that can happen automatically as well. I mean, for example, um, I, I, I've lost the question. <laughs> <laughs> Completely. By the way, one comment. I mean, I at least Tom wallowing in the sentimental kind of, oh, the 70s were the greatest time of the school. I think that's absolute nonsense. I mean, if you really, if you look at the documents of that period, critically, in terms of kind of what goes on now, I think you would swallow your words. Well, it's, there's a kind of a glamour to that time. But it's, you know, it's a certain time away, but I think you have to be careful with that, right? No, but do you think students are good enough now? Do you think we have as good as students then? Or do you think we have very good students and then it's just simply a problem of the school? And then we can have as we can have ever ever decreasing range of people coming into the school until we just all suddenly need to research and psychology. Yeah, I've no way of I've no way of commenting on the way that the students now are better than the students in the seventies. I mean it's absolutely well, no, <laughs> absolutely impossible. You think of, but I think there is a serious issue. I think that what you are actually asking is whether the level of fee 
is uh, forming a kind of a, a screen and that certain people that the institution needs to be participants in this, this game of risk cannot understand. Is that your question? I'm going to ask Louisa to, to speak before I do. I mean, yeah. one thing I think about what you've said is, is that it hangs on your, your phrase, grant aided. I mean, it seems to me that what you say must be pushing on an open door here. I can't think there's anyone here who, who wouldn't wish to see a kind of wider intake of students with the financial mechanisms to support that. Uh, if, on the other hand, uh, that required being kind of subject to public higher education regulation, having moved away from it. I mean, I tell you, you know, I, I really do think that publicly sponsored higher education institutions are the enemies of ideas or rapidly becoming so. So it's the question of, of, of how can you support the one social objective without falling into the tyranny of its cost? Uh, sorry, but Louisa was going to speak. Um. I agree with what Mark's saying, and I have to completely contest with what you're saying, Robert, because um, in having um, kept an eye and been in touch with um, the students who organised the static symposium at the University of Liverpool um, a couple of weeks ago, and also read about the University of Portsmouth symposium on architectural education a month before that, and having attended the one in Vienna, um, sure, students have tried to organise things to um, you know, in some way or other disrupt what's going on in their institution. But I don't think that you can say that the students here um, are any more, more or less effective than they are any, anywhere else. And I think that actually what you need to look at is um, the overall context, which is more that, um, you know, as, as Hal Foster states it, anything is art that's now put in a museum. I mean, it's very difficult to be um, in a sort of, in a cultural sense, um, very provocative because virtually everything that is provocative is already accepted anyway. And I think that that is a problem um, that needs to be dealt with in the school. And I think various units are attempting to deal with that very, very effectively. But I think there is a real difference between our generation of students and generations of students mm. behind them and before them. And I don't think that's necessarily to do with whether we can afford to pay or not. And, I mean, I totally agree that it would be great to have the fees learned, and if there's any way we can possibly do that, for God's sake, let's do it. But I really don't think that that's actually going to make an immense amount of difference in the type of things that go on in this place. Yeah, sure. But, I mean, what's going to happen in four or five years' time when the, you know, the number of students coming into this place is you know, getting smaller and smaller? Is it, is it fine then? Can we just carry on like that? Yeah, but, I, mean, I don't they, think it necessarily is. Yes, because there's actually more students in the last years than they were four years ago, so, you know. And we have no, been having the Scottish, you know, we have the Scottish Sorry? I was counting your um, assertion that there are more with saying when it's fractions, but it's either more or less. Yeah. Know? Oh, fine. We're no more. Okay, what should you say? on. Yeah, but, I mean, <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I mean, 30 students down five years ago. Sorry? About 30, 40 students down five years ago. Five years ago? What about three years ago? Well, I'm sorry. The, the actual level of the fee increase makes surprisingly little difference <coughs> over a period of perhaps five to eight years. You'd be surprised how little difference that actually makes. The um, effect of the scholarship of offering people the you know the two third scholarship has obviously made an enormous difference, and I think you know those students have really contributed something. School. But I mean, I think that it's one of the things we should really consider that from the point of view of the future, that we need really lateral thinking on how budgets are done. I don't know how, what the answer is to that at all, but we need somebody to actually come and tell us, you know, how you can do this without forever increasing fees, because I agree you can't go on doing that forever. I think uh, what uh, Robert said, in, in terms of uh, engaging with the involvement at large, uh, not necessarily the direct participation of students in the processes, but uh, the question of the whole organization of EAA being involved with the environment might actually benefit 
DAA financially as well. Because if it is seen as a socially relevant institution, and uh, I will go back to my first comment, by the elite, not necessarily by some of uh, then it could attract uh, funds from various sources. And there are quite a huge uh, amounts of funds being spent on arts projects here and there, some of which could go to the AA. I think, I think it's right. I think all of those things that we seek so desperately and have in recent years been more successful at achieving in terms of sponsorship and consultancy and so on, I think they stem perversely from the act of stating a position, a clear position, rather than um, maintaining academic immunity. I think academic immunity is very dangerous and that it actually distances us from those possibilities. I mean, at the level of like increasing the kind of social groups or members of social groups who can participate in the education of the AA, uh, although it might sound comic, I mean, there are models for doing that, historically. Uh, the Jesuits and the Bolshevik part of it, uh, you know, both of whom, you know, deliberately kind of encompassed that objective and made arrangements to do it. What I think, you know, to go back to your, your, your point, the grant aided, you know, what you'd be selling your birthright absolutely is the thought of kind of entering the kind of higher educational system where, you know, it's not at all the same issue as it was since you hark back to the 70s, where actually there was quite a lot of autonomy for schools that joined that system. The unwritten history of Thatcherite Britain is not that we returned to a kind of marketplace, uh, but she bred a new type of kind of bureaucrat who stalks the halls of universities, hospitals, whatever. Uh, and in order to join that, that's what you have to put up with. That's not to dispute the objective, uh, but it's, it's to specify what the appropriate means might be for the AA. But, but is it totally, I mean, this fantastical to assume that if <coughs> this school um, develops and invents and formulates a <coughs> form of education which is against those criteria, it considered to be good value for money, and to produce effective architectural citizens, that it would not then begin to mm. attract um, grant aid again on its own terms. Mm. Absolutely. The main attack against the school is that it is embarking into an introspective and yeah. self-serving um, discussion. That's what they say. They don't say uh, um, necessarily that they wish you to um, adopt a national curriculum. Let's imagine that a kind of cultured Elia still survived with kind of wider powers than it was stripped down to in the first place. You know, perhaps there would have been, you know, I mean, there the, were the sort of possible negotiations with, with different bodies, but with the higher education system as such, with the current level of regulation and kind of, you know, the, the disastrous kind of descent into pure bureaucracy, credentialism, careerism, opportunism, I can't see it. But the no, fear of that, the irrational fear of that, should not constantly um, promote an extreme response. I agree. Um, which it tends to. <coughs> I mean, take a model of Cooper Union. Cooper Union, its grant run as an endowment with severe restrictions and has suffered over the years from these restrictions. It has had to institutionalize a, a, a couple of places for outsiders, right? Because only in New York State people, students can come in. and. They had to do that simply to get people from outside coming through the system because it was simply too restricted. And that's the extreme, of course, it's fantastic because it's free in school completely. It's difficult to sustain that kind of. I, I completely what you said, you know, about the, the rivers of the <coughs> education network and all the rest of it, and of course the preservation of the independence, that's primordial. But um, it's very difficult uh, in, when you look, most. People who want to study architecture in this country, they, they can't come here. They don't have to go elsewhere. Because that's, that's all it is. It's just as simple as that. So they go off and do psychology of Oxford, you know, history of Cambridge, and they just don't come. They don't have the opportunity to get touched into this. You know, I, I was very lucky to go around. Very grateful. It's fantastic. But it shouldn't be luck. It seems to me that the topic for the people in this room 
is the quality of education. There are faculty and there are students here. Faculty's primary obligation is the quality of teaching. If that's what's at issue here, and that's what the turmoil is about at its base, I believe, uh, I think quality students will take care of themselves. And we can debate endlessly whether there's a, a mechanism to, to uh, finance students. That, too, will take care of itself if the institution has quality education. I think that's what we're here for. But does this mean that if you have very good quality teaching, you will necessarily produce uh, good, uh, good work? I mean, it does depend also on the student. I think if you don't have the first, you will never have the last. Absolutely, but I, I think it does depend also <coughs> on the second. So I, I, don't, I don't necessarily agree that fees are a way of uh, acquiring good students because I, I went to graduate school where you had to actually, in America, where you had to pay uh, quite high fees. And there are students who, who, who are from uh, an affluent uh, background who, who have the money who come there. And there are students who work very hard and somehow they did. I mean, there are ways of, so I think if you're dedicated and if you really want to go, and, and so the, the question is, do we have dedicated students? And not necessarily are we having uh, problems uh, having dedication because uh, we, we require fees. And I, I don't think they follow. And, 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 so, and, and the, the intensity that I very much um, benefited from by going to graduate school was precisely by finding myself in, in amongst a, a series of students who were, who were absolutely passionate about what they were doing which I, as, as a new, maybe, member of the staff, was, was, I was, I was surprised um, coming to the school. Perhaps it's, uh, I, haven't, I haven't given it enough time. So I don't think, I, I, I don't think the fees are a way of solving this. I don't believe it. I, I don't think it, it will never stop. I mean, it would be very nice if you don't have fees. It would be, it's, but I'm, I'm not a financial, uh, experts in any way, and I, I couldn't suggest a way of solving it, but I, I don't think that that will solve the problem. But, but I mean, that does seem to me like a historical and social point uh, for those who kind of feel embarrassed uh, that the social composition of those who enter uh, DAA is kind of, you know, insufficiently mixed. And it's like a difference between um, English and American education. That is to say, most progressive forces in the states have always argued that social mobility starts taking place at the level of graduate school. That is to say, you know, what, whatever undergraduate you do, uh, you, 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 know, you earn your spurs there and get the scholarships, bursaries, whatever. Now, do you, you know, for, across a whole range of issues, uh, kind of English higher education has always placed mo more emphasis on an undergraduate formation. And I think that's where, in a sense, the, the, the problem lies. It's a, there's a real social difference there. And so the question is, how do you, without being part of a state-funded system, generate a certain level of social mobility and justice at an undergraduate level? In a, a, well, I, mean, I, I don't have an answer to I'm that. Not, I'm I, not really sure if I really understood what you said, but I, I went to the <coughs> undergraduate to find it in, I, I went to the bathroom myself, and uh, it was a place where I didn't have to pay fees. You didn't necessarily have very good students. Uh, I, I don't think it's a, it's a problem of undergraduate, graduate, uh, it's a problem of, I mean, it, it, I, I really don't think that that's the issue. I, and Tashi, there is an element where there, there's a lot of